incredible, monstrous uh, armored bulldozer was basically going from one side of this building to the other, uh, tearing it down. I had no idea how we were going to stop it. Welcome back, friends, to another episode of the Rigor Mortis Podcast. I'm Adam, and with me again this week, Jason. How you doing, man? Uh, not too bad. Seems like we're getting into this now. We're getting into it. You swear we've already done this tonight. <laughs> so we've got a little bit of a lighter topic. This I, one's actually a fun one. I really enjoyed this one. Kind of a little crazy. We might let our hair down a little bit during this one. Yeah, the de- gloves definitely might come off in this. What are we doing for a topic tonight? Well, today we are doing what is, I guess, locally known, and probably maybe more nationally known, I guess, as the Killdozer story. The Killdozer. Uh, but this is really the story of Marvin John Hemeyer. Right, Okay. Yeah, Hemeyer uh, was born in 1951 in South Dakota, lived there for most of his life before he moved to Grand Lake, Colorado, uh, which was about 16 miles from Granby, Colorado. Granby, Colorado is a beautiful town. I actually have family there. Do you? I do. And a different one. A different Granby. <laughs> Granby, Quebec. But they're actually nothing alike. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's a very nice area anyway. Um, but Hemeyer had lived there uh, for about 10 years before things uh, started to go south. But his friend, uh, John Bulgery, um, actually says he's a very likable person. Um, and his brother also says that he'd bend over backwards for anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Likely story from a friend and a brother, though. That makes sense, absolutely. Of but, course. but I think most people in the town actually described him as a very likable person. Um, but there was somebody, I believe... Uh, that has something to the contrary to say. Yeah, a local resident by the name of Christy Baker claimed that her husband was threatened by Hemeyer after refusing to pay for a disputed muffler repair. Now, here's the thing, right? I don't see anything unusual about that. But it is unusual that he had paid Hemeyer the $124 repair bill through somebody else. He gave the money to somebody and they brought the money to him. So he didn't really? even want to be around him anymore after that. So I almost wonder if there was like a restraining order or something. I don't know. I think there was. it sounds more like there was some kind of a confrontation and uh, Baker backed out. Right. So he owns his own muffler repair shop, um, which I believe he purchased uh, two acres in 1992 from a federal agency for $42,000 uh, to build this muffler shop. But then he later agreed to sell the land to Cody Dotchev so that he could build a concrete plant batch concrete batch plant on the property which i believe the agreed on price was almost like a quarter of a million dollars 250,000 wow. so he buys it for 42,000 and he's fixing to sell it for 250,000 that is a great investment yes now according to Susan Dorcheff he might change his mind and increase the price to $375,000 wow yeah and later demanded a deal worth approximately $1 million. Well, that'd be a hell of a turnover on that property. Well, then just don't buy it and have your concrete plant somewhere else. Right, absolutely. It must be a good location. But um, some people actually think that this negotiation um, actually happened before the rezoning proposal was heard from the town council. So uh, almost like the his property value was going to go up or down mm-hmm. and he wanted to kind of cut it off and, before it happened. So he had some insight, maybe. Right. Interesting. Now, in 2001, the Zoning Commission and the town's trustees approved the construction of the concrete plant. Hemeyer attempted to appeal the decision, but was unsuccessful. Um, I mean, he ended up selling the property, I'm assuming? I believe he uh, was fighting with them because this new construction, um, the construction happened on this new concrete batch plant, actually blocked the access to his muffler shop. Um, he was actually fined uh, $2,500 from the town for uh, different violations, including junk cars on the property, uh, not being hooked up to the sewer line, and he had actually tried to cross eight feet of the concrete factory to hook up to a sewer line, which was illegal, and he decided, and he was discovered dumping waste from his improvised tank into a ditch resulting in this fine. So he was just dumping his raw waste really wherever he wanted. Now I wonder if the town knew about this prior to the construction of the concrete plant or if, you know, and just let it go, but because he's been stirring turds, they started yep. to hit him with fines. That's what I'm thinking too. Or is this something that they found <laughs> out during the construction? Like they're like, hey, we noticed that 
This guy is living like this. It smells like human it. shit in our ditch a lot. A lot, yeah. You know what I mean? If that's when they figured it out. But either way, uh, all this is kind of piling up now on Hemeyer. Right, and so much so that he decides to take matters into his own hands. Oh, really? He does. So what does he do? He actually goes, uh, gets one of his bulldozers. It was a modified Kamatsu D355A, which had a makeshift armor plating on it, which covered the cabin, the engine, and parts of the tracks. I would use this during a zombie apocalypse. Absolutely. Um, some places on this, the armor was over a foot thick, uh, which was made from concrete mix, ironic. I wonder if he got this from the concrete shop next to his place. But this concrete was actually sandwiched between uh, sheets of tool-grade steel. Wow. So this is, uh, this is uh, very strong. I mean, this is going to be resistant to explosives. Uh, You're certainly not going to be able to fire, fire through imagine. this with a police pistol. Right. So this is something that he must have assembled in, in Preparation for this event, right? Yeah, I believe it took him a couple of years to build this as well. Um, just just sitting in his garage all pissed off. Yeah, he had three external um, explosives that he could use and more than 200 rounds of ammunition that he could fire through little ports that he had uh, put in his armor. Not to go off topic, but have you ever played the video game Twisted Metal? Twisted Metal 2, I've been looking for for five years because it is one of my favorite games of all time. Now, in research for this episode... Did you feel yourself getting a little twisted mentally? No, but no. now I have the urge big time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, for visibility, the uh, bulldozer was fitted with several cameras linked to two monitors mounted to the vehicle's dashboard. This was before backup cam. Yeah, I was going to say, this is like uh, way ahead of its time. In a way, this guy is a genius. He's a pioneer. He's a pioneer. Don't try this, guys. <laughs> Now, the cameras were protected on the outside by a three-inch shield of bulletproof plastic. Here's my favorite part. He had the, con the thought ahead of time to put compressed air nozzles near these video cameras. That way, when they got dusty during his travels, he could just blow them off and he'd have clear vision again. The dude's a genius. That is very, very uh, incredible forward thinking. Yeah. Now, onboard fans... And an air conditioner we used to keep Hemeyer cool while driving because I'm sure under the pressure of destroying everything up front of you, you got to get hot in that thing. <laughs> Absolutely. So there's a little sight insight from him as well. What kind uh, of guns did he have on the ports? Oh, I love these. Uh, he it was fitted with a 50 caliber rifle. Wow. 380 semi-automatic rifle. That would be my choice. And a 22 long rifle, all fitted with a one and a half inch thick steel plate. Wow. Yeah. So this guy uh, is, is literally building an apocalypse machine. Yeah. I'll tell you what, you could survive the apocalypse in this thing for sure. <laughs> yeah, but apparently he had no intention on, on leaving it once he entered this vehicle because he actually, uh, once he lowered himself in, there was no way he could get out. He tipped the lid shut and it was really too heavy for anybody to lift. That's why it's the killdozer, man. Unbelievable. Totally nuts. So what does he do with this killdozer? Well, on June 4th, 2004, Hemeyer drove his armored bulldozer through the wall of his former business, the concrete plant. The town hall, the office of the local newspaper that had editorialized against him repeatedly. Right. Uh, the home of the former mayor in which his widow then resided. So he, had mu hey, so he must have died. He had passed. And a hardware store owned by another man he might have named in a lawsuit, as well as a few others. <laughs> so he takes this killdozer, he pulls it out of his garage, and he says, these are the six places I'm going to, and they're not surviving it today. What made him come up with this idea? This is crazy. And that tank being able, or the bulldozer really, being able to go through five, six buildings and still continue on, that's <laughs> impressive. There's a tomb. Uh, the attack lasted for two hours and seven minutes, damaging 13 buildings. Wow. Yeah, knocking out natural gas service to City Hall and the concrete plant. They're not getting to work the next day. No, they're not doing anything for a while. He also damaged a truck and destroyed part of a utility service center. Um, he actually did quite a bit of damage to um, all these properties. When The miracle part is that nobody was killed except for Hemeyer himself. But you know what? If you're going to die... You better die doing what you love, baby. It's like, you know what this reminds me of? Have you ever played The Sims? 
you build that motherfucking town up and you say, this is going to be an earthquake today. Dude, this... And this is going to be a tornado tomorrow. This guy played a lot of video games because <laughs> I'm seeing video games in this. I'm like... And by the way, we do not blame video games for violence. We are both avid game players. No, no. I mean, you know, we played these games that we're talking about. <laughs> Neither of us have harmed anybody. But this is a great idea. Yeah, I mean, it's just... Wow. And just the fact that nobody was harmed except for him... My well, nobody was killed. Nobody was killed except for him. Except for My him. favorite part of this whole thing is with everything that went against him and the town said, fuck you, we'll find you $2,500. By the end of this rampage, he costed the city $7 million. So maybe you can fight City Hall. I think he won. He won. Now, according to Grand County Commissioner James Newbery, Grand County Emergency Dispatchers Dispatchers used the reverse 911 emergency system to notify many residents and property owners of the rampage going on in town. Now, is that the uh, alert you get on your cell phone? I think so, but could you imagine brushing your teeth in the morning, getting ready for work or whatever, and getting an fo automated phone call? You're like, what the hell is this? And you answer, and they're like, there's a crazy guy on a bulldozer knocking all the buildings over. Stay inside. What do you do? You go outside. <laughs> You go outside, folks. If there's anybody coming at you with a bulldozer, you go outside. You know why? Because you can see it coming. That's fair. I'll give and then you, that. you can take off on foot, take off in your car, which is going to go a lot faster than the bulldozer. This is not certified survival advice, by oh, the way. Oh, no. And as we know from previous episodes, I'm no expert. I'm no expert, guys. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so most of the people in the town, of course, were were not happy, but there were some uh, some people who defended him. Really? Who his family? Well, defenders of Hemeyer contended that he made a point of not hurting anybody during his bulldozer rampage. I think that was just by poor by bad luck, because I think he, he good was, luck. Well, good luck to everybody in the community, but for him, he, I think he was hoping to hurt people. I don't. I really don't. I think that he got all the revenge he wanted. Do you think he did it because, uh, specifically because he knew nobody would be at these places at this time, you think? I would say yes. I mean, you're, you're ramming through the former mayor's, the widow of the former mayor's house. Right. You don't know if she's there or not. Right. And the concrete plant, you'd imagine there were some people working. But, I mean, he knew the schedules better than us. This was also, yeah. you know, back before everybody had to work 17-hour shifts, too. So. Yeah, that's true. There were times when places were closed. Now, Ian Dougherty, a bakery owner, said Hemeyer went out of his way not to harm anyone. Others offered different views. Yeah, they, of course, the, the police department, the, the sheriffs, um, argued that no one was injured was not due to good intent as much as to good luck. Um, Hemeyer had installed the two rifles from firing from the firing ports like we had talked about, and he actually fired 15 bullets from his rifle uh, at power transformers and propane tanks and things like that. And if one of those tanks had ruptured and exploded, anybody within about a half a mile would have been, been killed. Oh, shit, but I, you, I don't think he knew that. Maybe he did. I don't know. That's a freaking big that, explosion. That is a huge propane tank. Now, the sheriff's department said 12 police officers and residents of senior citizens' complex were within such a range. So there could have been a large number of fatalities, is, is what I'm taking from Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And also, uh, Hemeyer actually had fired many of the bullets from his rifle at Cody Dochev, because he actually had tried to stop the assault on this concrete plant uh, by using a wheel tractor scraper. So um, he, Hemeyer points the gun at him and basically says, fuck off, I'm destroying your building. <laughs> but what Hemeyer ends up doing is he, he ends up using his bulldozer to push the tractor scraper out of the way. I mean, it's destroying buildings. I can almost imagine that was pretty effortless for the bulldozer. Um, but after he had pushed it aside, he actually fired on two state patrol officers before they fired back at him. And the sheriff's department also said that uh, 11 of the 13 buildings that were bulldozed actually had people in them right before, right before they were destroyed. The town library actually had a children's program going on uh, when all this actually started. Wow, that could have been a terrible thing. So what did the cops do during this time to try to stop this assault from continuing? Well, one brave officer ran up and actually dropped a flash grenade uh, down the exhaust pipe. Wow. And did anything happen? This actually had no effect. Really? Wow. So the local and state patrol, uh, as well as the SWAT team, actually walked behind the bulldozer at one point uh, and were just firing right at it. But nothing was happening when they were shooting this 
this bulldozer. They actually tried to shoot the cameras as well, and the bulletproof glass protected them. They, they could do nothing. Could you imagine how Hemeyer must have felt when he was seeing his killdozer doing exactly what it was intended to do? Yeah, I mean, you know, take, take a beating and still keep going. I mean, a flash grenade down the, down the exhaust, it's getting shot at, it's, it ran through, you know, over a dozen buildings. Yeah, and, you know, the cops are, at this point, literally just walking down the street behind it, like, what the hell do we do now? One cop actually jumped on top of it, and he said it was like a... Like riding a Bronco Buster, but trying to figure out a way to get a bullet inside. Wow. Yeah, he had to jump off because he was getting hit hit with debris as he was destroying the buildings. I wonder how fast this thing could, was was able to go. Probably not terribly fast. I, I would imagine not. I mean, I've seen videos of the police just, just walking behind it. So, um, it's crazy. And from what I read, I mean, the local authorities and the state patrol thought they were running out of options and firepower and that they would that this guy soon would just start killing people. So, you know, he was considering some other things. Yeah, well, then Governor Bill Owens allegedly considered authorizing the National Guard to use either an Apache attack helicopter equipped with a Hellfire missile. Fucking Christ. I know, huh? For or, one guy. For one guy or two men, or, or a two-man firing team equipped with a Javelin anti-tank missile to destroy the bulldozer. Could, I don't even know what that means. Could you imagine being in small-town Colorado and seeing a fucking Apache helicopter shooting missiles down on something. That is crazy. Now, this was only to deem the option necessary due to Hemeyer's getting stuck in the Gamble's hardware store. So, he, he as he was destroying a building, he got stuck in the hardware store? Yeah. I mean, you can imagine with all the rubble and stuff. I could see how this could happen. Wow. That's unbelievable. And from what I've heard... The governor's office, of course, to this day, denies that they had ever even considered, you know, attack helicopters and things like that because of the collateral damage that it would have caused in the community. But um, as he was getting stuck in the hardware store, there was really two problems that happened. Yeah, what's that? The uh, the radio of the, the dozer had been damaged and the engine was leaking different fluid. So, of course, to destroying 13 buildings, it's going to be some heavy damage to your engine components and things like that even if just overheating oh yeah of course i mean i'm actually amazed that this thing made it as far as it did the bulldozer's single engine eventually failed um and he might have dropped one tread into the basement he's like sagging through the floor right right and okay obviously going down in a hole i can't imagine it's gonna be very easy to pull this bulldozer out of the hole probably not even possible what he has right right and it was a very short time, it was about a minute later, one of the SWAT team members swarmed to the machine and, and heard a gunshot come from inside the cab. So at this point, they're assuming he's probably killed himself and given up. And in fact, later it was determined that Hemeyer had shot himself in the head with a three fifty seven caliber handgun. Uh, police first used explosives in an attempt to remove the steel plates, but after the third explosive failed, okay, third, uh, they cut through them with an oxycetylene cutting torch. So this is a... Uh, I've actually used one of these before. <laughs> I was like, how the fuck did you pronounce that Yeah, word? no, this, this is something you would use to cut heavy gauge steel, okay. for sure. Uh, Grand County Emergency Management Director Jim Hallahanan stated that authorities were able to access and remove Haymeyer's body at 2 a.m. on June 5th. Right, so they, they weren't rushing to get in the cab just in case he hadn't shot himself or, or something like that. They didn't want to be a danger to themselves. And if he did shoot himself, he's not going anywhere. So Yeah, no, this is crazy. Nobody was ready for this. Nobody in that community was ready for this. And I'll tell you what, if this something like this were to happen again, nobody would be ready for it to happen. No, not anywhere. at all. Well, it's, he actually had stated that uh, he couldn't fucking believe he didn't get caught because he actually had agents like at his house interviewing him in front of his garage with this killdozer in the garage and nobody even bad than I had it. What were they saying, I wonder? Uh, it was something about, like, stolen pipe or something from what I read. Oh, hey, that's quite a killdozer you got there. <laughs> <laughs> so he did leave, uh, leave some writings for his motivation. Uh, some of them were on the wall of his shed, and he actually recorded a number of audio tapes uh, explaining his motivation for the attack. Now, the first recording was made on April 13th of 2004. The last recording was made 13 days before the rampage. So he had been doing this for, for quite a while. This guy should have had a podcast. That would be epic. That would have been. I mean, this guy, he's, 
<laughs> He's something else. Uh, God built me for this job, he would say. Uh, this was uh, said in his first recording. He also said it was God's plan that he not be married or have a family so that he could be in a position to carry out such an attack. To not be a selfish person in that sense, I guess. Sure. I, I, I could see the thought behind that. Uh, this guy definitely deeply religious. I think God will bless me to get the machine done, to drive it, to do the stuff that I have to do. I am the co-captain of my life. God is first, I am second. Okay? This is where he's taking me. It's pretty intense. That is pretty intense. Now, investigators later found Hemeyer's handwritten list of targets. According to police, it included the buildings he destroyed, the local Catholic church, which he did not damage, and the names of various people who had cited against him in, the pa in past disputes. I mean, I, I, I kind of agree with the sheriff's office now that we've gone through this. I think that it probably is luck that nobody got killed here. Oh, yeah. As a, at first, I was like, nah, no way. But no, I think that that was pure luck. And I mean, realistically, this was before, you know, the age where people are shooting up Walmarts and schools and things like that. So this was one of the first, like, quote unquote, revenge crimes, I would say. Yeah, this was definitely a guy that, that feels like his community has spited him. And he was going to get his revenge back yep. on them. Absolutely. And that machine, I mean, I don't know how he pulled that off. but I mean, of course, the crimes are not cool, but the machine is definitely something else. And we'll post videos. Uh, there is some videos of the attack on Facebook, and we'll, we'll post them. I wonder uh, if that movie... There is a movie based after this. Okay, I was going to say. I think it's called Kill Those. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one! <laughs> <laughs> but, wow. So, I wonder what kind of uh, punishment he would have gotten hadn't he have committed suicide in the end. I mean, I would assume he would have gotten many, many attempted murder charges at the very least. I got to agree with that. So, he figured before he... He probably thought he killed somebody. He probably thought he must have killed a number of people. And before he was going to spend the rest of his life in prison, he was just going to kill himself in the tank. Yeah, I call I it a tank, the killdozer. Yeah, I don't think he had any intentions of coming out of that alive. Especially where his, you know, the notes that he had left. I'm very curious why the Catholic Church was on his list, though, because he is a pretty religious man. Yeah, but you know what? As they say, you know, there's, there's the Catholics... And then there's the rest of Christianity. So he probably was one of the others, and they just didn't like the Catholic Church because of well, all the reasons why most people don't like that don't like the Catholic <laughs> Church don't like the Catholic Church. Or maybe it was so innocent that their insurance was about to run up and they needed a new church. Or something like that, too. Because he knew that probably nobody would have been at the church at the time. Who knows? <laughs> uh, so what else we got on this? Are we just about uh, ready to put a fork in it? Put a fork in it. Put a fork in it. Well, you know what, guys? Uh, we appreciate you listening. Uh, do us a favor. If you like us, tell a friend. Until next time, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. We're not hard to find. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at The Rigor Mortis Podcast. Yep, and also our email, Podcast at gmail.com. I love the emails, guys. Well, I'm on my lunch break at work. This is something I look forward to reading, so please keep me entertained and keep our inbox full. Yes, absolutely. Let us know if you love the show. Let us know um, what we can improve on, and uh, you know if you have any other uh, suggestions for us, we'd love to hear those as well. Yeah, we definitely love listener suggestions. Keep them coming in. We've gotten great feedback so far. Absolutely, and we have our most important, probably... Uh, social media would be the, the Rigor Mortis Podcast Patreon page. Yes, please, please take a look at our Patreon page. You know, we're an independent podcast. We don't have a whole lot of money to do this. We're kind of doing it as a passion uh, and a hobby uh, that we want to pursue. Absolutely, and every minute we're out here working on this is uh, uh, one more minute that our wives are getting upset with us. So. Yeah, so please help us justify that to our wives, as well as help us to grow the show. Uh, this show is brought to you by people like you. Absolutely, and all your donations... Uh, just help us to make the show better and do more editing uh, and be able to put more back into you. And like we were saying, if we can justify this to our wives, then we can certainly justify putting out a couple more episodes a week. Absolutely. And uh, thank you guys always for listening. Yes, goodbye.